who had hired to do support, move them out of support, and into the engineering org, and then rebuild that team from the ground up. And so I believe the first person I hired after after I joined was Phil. That is Chris Dilt, one of the original founders of Enterprise Roku Support and co-founder of Elm Insights. I'm Josh Burke, your host for the Salesforce Developer Podcast. And here on the podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. Today, we sit down and talk with Chris and his fellow co-founder, Phil Ripperger, about the early days of Heroku Support, some of the war stories that they've gotten into, and we'll talk about their current product over at Elm Insights, platform experts. But we start with some of the early years with Phil describing about how he joined that team that Chris was just talking about. Yeah. So this was what, November-ish 2010? Yeah. Chris. Okay. Yeah. It was, it was right at the end of the year. And and I, I remember the day coming into work. Actually, it was morning. I was eating breakfast and the, the news, I was just checking probably TechCrunch, who knows, but the, <laughs> the news about Heroku being acquired by Salesforce hit and then walking to Engine Yard and everyone was kind of just in shock that the main competitor of Engine Yard had just been bought by Salesforce. And oh, I remember wow. yeah. Chris, Chris had left maybe two weeks prior, maybe a month. The timing's a little bit fuzzy, but it, was, yeah. it wasn't long before I, re I remember thinking, well, that was good timing on Chris's part. <laughs> 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 nice, nice. And then it was probably two, two to three months later that I reached out to Chris and moved over to Heroku. I think I started March fifteenth, twenty eleven. So I think I was employee number thirty or thirty one, but first official support hire. And then those two engineers that he mentioned were at that point they were able to move over to engineering full time. So shout out to Terrence and David for doing support and engineering in the very early days. Got it. Got it. So let's talk a little bit about those early days and like Chris, maybe follow up with like your instinct to get the engineers back into engineering and then starting now it's just kind of occurring to me that you were basically trying to create a customer support team slash department for a company that's just been bought by Salesforce. What was like your plan at the time? Like what did you know needed to have happen? A couple of things. So first that the way you phrase the question, it can sound really daunting, right? You're joining <laughs> Salesforce. Salesforce is known all about their customers. Um, yeah. One thing, one thing that, was made very clear at the onset of that acquisition was that for at least an, a long period of time, measured in, yeah. in a number of years, Heroku was going to be kind of incubated in its own sort of bubble um, from it. Salesforce. So I didn't have to start integrating immediately, mm -hmm. but I did have to try and keep par with their level of customer support and, and attention of the customer. So really what I did is... I thought about it in a couple of ways, which is who's our customer and how do we take care of them? And on Heroku, that customer is a developer, especially in those days, right? So all we had running on Heroku at the time of the acquisition was Rails apps or really Ruby apps. Um, yeah. and, and it was developers deploying their own apps. We didn't really gotcha. have any big businesses starting to use us yet, full on using us yet. We, that was in the works and was starting to happen. So we tailored support to do developer support. And so what that means is we need to bring on really ace talent, um, mm -hmm. technical talent onto the team. It's because what we have is people that are very well-known engineers out in the developer community opening mm -hmm. up support tickets and asking questions. And we have to have a staff that can hold their own technically with these people that are opening up these cases, right? So, so we yeah. look for people like Phil that had a strong developer background that we could pull in. The one thing that we had to do too, I had to do too, is think through, okay, well, those people like to be engineers. Why do they want to do support? We can map out a career progression into engineering. It's not a guarantee, hmm. but it's there hmm. and, and it can happen. And it really started hmm. with moving, initially moving David and Terrence out and saying, mm -hmm. okay, this can work. We have prior art for it. We know how to make it happen. And then after that, I looked at, once we stopped up the team a bit, how can I get the next person into engineering purposefully, hmm. mindfully? Um, so that, so that way that is, it's almost like a C team for engineering. Mm -hmm. So people can come in, grow their careers in the direction they want to go in. And it works for some people. Other people, they don't 
want to go in that path. And people like Phil kept working in my, in my organization, helping me grow the organization and moved up into leadership. And so um, there, mm-hmm. there was multiple paths for people to take, but it helped us always be able to attract that talent that we really needed to. Nice. So that's interesting because I, I know I've interviewed a surprising number of people who have gone from customer support and Salesforce to be Salesforce developers. And then they kind of go into a consultancy. I think I've got a couple of PMs on there, but it's always been kind of an accidental route, like making it that purposeful. A sounds kind of unique and B, what do you think are some of the positives there? Like, do you think that that you're making better engineers or is it, was it really just so that you could get technical talent with a carrot and a stick? It's really both, right? You can go, first of all, you want to make something really good for the employees and for the people you're attracting. And so we can, with that plan in place, we were able to go out to uh, make possibly even customers, people that were deploying things onto Heroku and, and mm-hmm. find some of their top engineers and say, hey, you've been a top engineer, like a lead engineer yeah. maybe, on why don't you come over here and help us scale thousands of apps? You're going to see more nice. a, a larger breadth of problem than you mm-hmm. ever will working on a single app. And, and it's it. it's not easy. Like you really have to help some of the biggest, some of the top 10 internet sites scale. Um, th- yeah. This is hard stuff. So there is that. But then... There's also, hey, we're moving people from support into engineering. So yes, it makes them better engineers because they're approaching engineering ever after that with customer empathy top of mind, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. They were in those kind of so-called trenches and support and said, I'm not going to do this thing because I know that's going to be a bad customer experience. And I don't want my customers to have that experience because I know what it's like because I had to hear from them firsthand for a number of years before I got gotcha. over here. So there was that. And then for me... Personally, as I continue to scale out the team, um, there was like this sort of long game for me, which was really paid off over the years, which is I now have a bunch of ex-employees spread throughout the engineering org. I have mm. these contacts everywhere where I have really good long-standing relationships with them. Got so, it. And, and so does the support team. So we can have inroads and, and make headway mm-hmm. when, we, when support needs to into parts of the engineering org. And I think traditionally... In a lot of companies, you can find some some resistance when support says, hey, can you guys go fix X? And the yeah. engineering org says, well, no, that's not a priority. And support really thinks it is. And, and that can be a point of contention. And, and we really try to break down those barriers by mapping that stuff out and saying, well, we're going to yeah. be doing this for a number of years. So let's do some things now that might take years to pay off. But when they pay off, it'll pay off dividends. Nice. Nice. And then this is definitely to both of you uh, to kind of dig into that a little bit more. Like Heroku is a pretty unique offering it just in general in the in the tech world. H- how does that then translate into like unique technical challenges? Yeah, I can I can take that one. I think the the uniqueness of Heroku is that a lot of the developers that we work with they would come to us expecting to be able to adjust server settings like they had mm. in previous roles or previous companies. Like, oh, we need we need to be able to configure the Apache configuration file for this app or the Nginx conf file, or we need more RAM or swap or CPU or whatever. And mm-hmm. Heroku didn't have, well, Technically, you can configure Apache or Nginx config files. It's a little bit different, but Mm -hmm. Heroku's concept of a dyno and taking care of the routing layer and restarting processes that fail, like that was a unique challenge, I would say, early on because it Mm -hmm. was was just such an unheard of thing. Even deploying with Git. I I think the the Git push Heroku uh, deployment method that I think Heroku can be credited with inventing that. That was yeah. a concept early on that we had to explain and work through with customers. Nice. And I have to say, I think Git push Heroku is something that made me addicted to Git. Like that was the gateway drug for me to just do everything in Git. So, so thank you for yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, it, it was really a game changer. The world hadn't seen deployments done that way end to end. I, I would say to Salesforce credit, and this is this is worth calling out. We in the early days, probably for, well, I don't want to put a time frame on it, but let's just say multiple years, Salesforce had a very 
hands-off process mm. with Heroku and and basically gave us freedom to build and grow the company. So that's why Chris was able to build a support organization in the way that he just described because he he basically had complete freedom. We had complete freedom on who to hire. We would mm. we would go look for people who were smart and doing interesting things and maybe they were doing freelance work or maybe they weren't. But we basically had free reign. The engineers did and and the support side did. So Salesforce should be credited with giving us a a hands-off uh, approach for the first few years to build things out. Gotcha. And support customers how we how we wanted to. Nice. Yeah. And it, that would even go so far as to say because of the type of people that we're hiring, hiring across the board within Heroku, you know, you then think about people going to conferences and employees giving talks and all mm-hmm. sorts of different positions. And you're at a talk and you're like, whoa, that person just gave that awesome talk, but th- they work in support. Like, let me go talk to them. And then you can get like some <laughs> nice additional interest that way. Yeah. Nice. W- one thing I would add on of the uniqueness is also. Heroku ran exclusively, still does, on top of AWS. Um, mm-hmm. It was the obvious choice at first. Um, there wasn't really any other cloud infrastructure providers that were viable at the time. And then as things like Azure and GCP came on uh, the scene, mm-hmm. there was choice in infrastructure provider. But we were choosing mm-hmm. to obfuscate that, to abstract that away from the customer. Right. right? So they didn't have to think about what kind of infrastructure their app was running on. It just runs on Heroku. It runs in a dyno, which mm-hmm. is just a container. Um, but we were doing that well before containers were a thing, before Docker was a thing. Right. Um, so, right. so we called it a dyno. It's a container. You need to think about how many containers you need and and mm. how do you, is your app running efficiently. And so when there were problems with Amazon, we had to think, oh, well, we can't point the finger at Amazon. We cannot blame Amazon for this right. outage, right? Right. That, that was our choice, not our customer's mm-hmm. choice. So that failure is really on us. So we have to, mm-hmm. but we want to talk about it transparently so we know what's going on. And that was a, that was always a really, I think, thin rope to walk on to mm. um, strike that balance between being transparent, but also not coming off like, we're just blaming an underlying infrastructure pro- provider. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, well let's let's talk a little bit more specific. Like let's uh, let's talk a little bit about your your greatest hits. For instance, and I'm asking the audience to hear about this in all caps. But tell me about the day Shaq tweeted. Yeah, so, that was a fun day. <laughs> that, that was a fun day. So um, a customer comes to us. This, this is a two days before Shaq tweeted. Um, mm-hmm. They come to us and they say, we can't tell you what's going on, but a really big celebrity is going to announce something really important on our app. And, and their app was, Phil, I don't know if you remember the name of it, but the app exactly was uh, video for Twitter or Twitter for video. So you do little short video segments, maybe not so different than TikTok, although this is way before TikTok. And then, so we we rush. We're like, yeah, we hear this stuff all the time. But we don't think it's going to be a big deal. But but we're <laughs> but we always took people seriously. So so we kind of rushed yeah. to help them get some stuff in place. Yeah, we reminded them a little bit more. To, heads up would have been good. And then all of a sudden they're like, okay, it's live. And like our servers just lit up, and we're like, what is going on? <laughs> um, and it turned out that Shaq tweeted his retirement announcement, uh, and he has like millions of followers right and he didn't Mm -hmm. just tweet that he was retiring he tweeted hey i have something important to tell you and dropped a link to the video (laughs) that was running on on heroku oh by like midday it was like the headline article (laughs) on espn is like you know shaq's retiring with a link out to the video to that video yeah everybody was hitting it and it was a really fun day in, in Heroku because we we were all excited about getting all this traffic and, and we weren't in the press. We were so excited that one of our customers was like getting that much attention and driving that much traffic. That was probably the first big event that we could we could think of that had happened on Heroku that Heroku powered. Like there yeah. were uh, there were other sites like Urban Dictionary has always been one of the the great examples of a a huge site that runs on Heroku. Uh, yeah. from from the very beginning and that was there and like 
your parents may or may not have heard of Urban Dictionary, <laughs> but everyone yeah. knows who Shaq is. And so just to right. be able to, to talk about that, like, oh, yeah, we, we helped power that event and that announcement. That was fun. And the other big difference is a site like Urban Dictionary, they know how much traffic they have. They've already optimized certain parts of the app to handle that much traffic. Mm. It's pretty steady, right? Yeah. The Shaq thing, they literally went from like zero to 60, whatever, right? Like, I don't remember exactly how many right. questions. What's the appropriate scale from obscure to yeah. epic? <laughs> yeah, but they went from nothing, no, almost right. no traffic to Shaq level traffic in an instant. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Check level traffic. So how did it go? Because it sounds like it went well and don't take this the wrong way, but how is that possible? Like how, like what goes into planning for something like that when there's no way that you're going to know that it's like ESPN is, is going to throw their logs into this fire? Well, so the infrastructure on Heroku was different back then. So the, okay. the secret is that we were running Varnish and Varnish is a caching layer that was in front of everything. So it cached the video and was serving the mm. video very fast. Now, the right way to do that would have been, let's get that video, let's cache it into CDN and have the CDN be delivering it and not be driving yeah. all that traffic through uh, something like Heroku where, because you're to stream the video, you're not actually processing a web request and it doesn't have to come through your web app and, and stuff mm. like that. So there's actually a better architecture, but at the end of the day, I think it was really varnished that save save the day um, and kept things up and running. Got it. Nice. Yeah, it, it went it went well given the amount of traffic and the uh, the popularity, but it was overall it was a success story, a fun story to tell. So, talking about preventing the boom a little bit, we have kind of a weird shared history. Like I wrote this no Duchess prototype that never ever actually had a single user. And a bunch of really dedicated people turned that into Trailhead. And, and I want to be clear here, like there's a rule on Project Trailhead, like Josh doesn't support production code, so Josh doesn't write production code. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like the closest I got was writing a Ruby CLI to help uh, process the challenge checks. And I think some of that code got morphed into like the Rails process that, that Trailhead actually works on. Uh, so if anything went really weird with launch, I just want you to know, was probably not my fault. But at the end of the day, Trailhead is a Heroku app. So what was it like to support Trailhead success at launch? Yeah, that's uh that's actually a really good story because it's it's a it's an internal project. It's important. I mean Trailhead today is a super important product for Salesforce. Um I think Yeah I would go so far as to say Salesforce thinks it's such an important project that they rebrand it all of their branding to try yeah. that theme branding. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I think, Chris, you you came to me, I don't remember when, but this probably would have been shortly after you were, had written your code, Josh. But mm -hmm. Chris came to me and said, hey, there's this internal project. They're on Heroku. You need to make sure that they're successful. And so I happened to be actually at the Heroku office in San Francisco that week, I met mm. with some of the project owners and product people for Trailhead. And they, this would have been early spring, probably around, maybe around this time of the year. And they said, we we have to be ready by Dreamforce. And so we, we kind of took that date and worked backwards from there and just took yeah. every, every best practice that we knew about and had had gone through with with all of these these fun stories that we've been sharing and and yeah. many more applied that to Trailhead running on Heroku and and made sure that when it when it launched at Dreamforce everything was ready to go and that that included load testing and scaling up the database the number of mm -hmm. dynos every best practice that we could think of and it, it was ultimately a success uh, and it's only grown from there and. I think the last time I checked in with the Trailhead team was probably about this time last year, and it was just like we we switched to quarterly check ins, and they mm. they they told me, yeah, we're we're fine. I don't know if we have anything for you this quarter. Everything's yeah. working well on Heroku. So, I mean, it went from a very small, extremely scrappy 
extremely dedicated team to, you know, an entire department. Do you remember, just out of curiosity, because I, I remember that Dreamforce so clearly because I was the weird guy running around asking if anybody had seen the trailhead slide in the keynote <laughs> and if they'd like, you know, actually tried it yet. And most people did had no idea what I was talking about. And then fast forward one year later, and I, I literally can't walk onto the XWeb floor without people coming to me and talking about trailhead. Like, do you remember what that year one traffic, like what their expectations were for that? I uh, I don't remember specific numbers. I remember a, a bump after Dreamforce. Uh, uh -huh. It it really took off though when it when it turned into a product that could be sold for use at customers mm -hmm. uh, for for customers to use internally. That's that was kind of the inflection point. And gotcha. and when that happened, everything was ready. So it wasn't it wasn't mm -hmm. like that caught anybody off guard. Um, mm -hmm. At least on as far as the Heroku infrastructure was concerned. Got it. But, yeah, got if, it. Yeah. If I recall correctly, though, there was added traffic and almost like a step function would like pop up, run for a while, pop up, run for a while, pop up. And mm. I think it correlates really well to you announce something at Dreamforce. People will get interested in it. They don't necessarily drop what they're doing and start using it. But then more trials get out there and start circulating. So you get an increase in traffic and almost right after Dreamforce, Salesforce is the, the roadshow, right? They do all the, the mini Dreamforce events and remote events around the world. And they start kicking that off and that lasts almost in another entire year. And like each one of those is more people talking about it, more, more yeah. attraction, more events where it's getting reinforced to, to folks. So we, we start seeing that traffic kind of kick up. One of the things I think is cool about Trailhead is unlike some of the other things we didn't see, like a Super Bowl commercial, a big spike, and then you see like a drop off and a really long tail until they shut it off. And mm -hmm. in things like Trail Sport, uh, excuse me, Trailhead, where here's some more traffic. Time goes on. Here's some more traffic. More traffic. <laughs> here's some more traffic. And, and it's, you can kind of start to anticipate some things coming up. Like, okay, yeah. if you keep growing at this rate, you're going to need a bigger database by this time, or you're going to start <laughs> need to look at sharding data and all these yeah. other things that, that we can go into and, and help, you know, at that time, help the trailhead team really figure out. Yeah. I, I think I'm going to remember we're going to need a bigger database. I, I like the JAWS reference there. <laughs> yeah. And one of the, one of the unique things um, with the trailhead having run on Heroku, and this is only unique internally to Salesforce. I'm going yeah. to peel back the curtain a little bit for, yeah. the, for the listeners. Support, generally speaking, and CSG, Customer Success Group inside of Salesforce, does not support yeah. internal projects. I didn't necessarily like that approach because <laughs> we're supporting our biggest customers. Like, why not support these internal projects? And, and that view was held with the Heroku leadership at the time. So... Yeah. So the trailhead team had been like introduced to my team and we're like, we're going to take this. Traditionally, nice. that would have just gone, kind of gone over to the engineering team who, yeah. while, while more than, you know, competent at understanding how to scale some of those things, yeah. um, approaches it a little bit differently. Whereas our team approaches, we're going to advise a customer to success. And, and that's how we were like, our thoughts are ingrained and in what we do. The engineering orgs may be a little bit more focused on what problem are you having? We know how to solve that problem. Tell me the problem, we'll solve it. And we're like, we, we're going to help you anticipate those problems. So um, the uniqueness was that the trailhead team even got to work with our team because traditionally, if we had followed the status quo in, in Salesforce, yeah. we wouldn't have worked with an internal team at all. Uh, until something went horribly wrong. <laughs> until something went horribly <laughs> wrong. Well, thank you, and I appreciate your style of preparation to avoid the boom, especially when it came to something like Trailhead. Okay, so let's focus a little bit more on your current gig. Both of you struck out on your own post Heroku. What's the current company like, and what was your impetus to do that? Was it just like looking for some brand new challenge kind of thing, or what? What was the reason for the new company? I think we started Elm Insights, uh, and, and more specifically, Elm Insights is kind of the, the parent company for what we're doing, but Platform Experts mm -hmm. is a Heroku add-on, and it's meant to be a community around 
built around Heroku customers, developers, add-on providers, and basically anybody who who uses Heroku, who loves it, who's an expert. And then we we also built some tools inside that community that can look at your app and provide a recommendation. And we, Chris and I, I think we we saw a need for that kind of in our last few months, maybe last year or so at Heroku. Gotcha. We we wanted to do it. We we never really had the resources or the time to build something like that. So mm-hmm. it became kind of a natural next step for us. And uh, we we built the community in Slack, so you you get access to the community through a Heroku add-on, and then we also built a lot of the tooling as a Slack bot. And now that that probably looks like a great decision, but we we actually <laughs> st- we after Salesforce <laughs> by Slack, but we actually started on all of this before that, and then right, and then we we woke up to the news one day and we were like, uh, okay, <laughs> we're. <laughs> We're building with more Salesforce tools. Yeah. <laughs> Phil, you specifically, I feel like Salesforce keeps doing this to you. <laughs> <laughs> like we keep buying companies that are important to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. So, and so to frame this, of course, I'm legally bound to talk about Slack as if it is just any other company right now. But that frames this question very nicely because what was the appeal to Slack? Like why why did that turn into your tool of choice? Well, we, we had a looked at discuss and a few others discord. and ultimately yeah. discord sorry discord and a few others and ultimately yeah. it came down to slacks where i think a lot of people are already mm-hmm. and if you're already mm-hmm. using slack adding one more channel um one more workspace as the term- terminology they use um yeah. to get access to some heroku help and say um stuff like that you it's really easy. It's right there. You don't need to fire up yet another app on your computer while you're trying to work and, and get other stuff done. So gotcha. it just kind of made sense. And then the bot integration in Slack is really good. Yeah, the the API is is really it's easy to develop against. The libraries are already there for interfacing. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, we we lived in Slack while at Heroku. That was our. Mm. That was our our day to day. Basically, everything that we were doing in the support group happened in there, and we could talk to engineers in there. So i I think it was just a natural progression to. Uh, oh, we actually we also had this is probably key because this was the genesis of the idea. Yeah, um, we we brought a couple select customers into the Heroku Slack using the official invite mechanism. Um, okay. And at the time, it was it was a decision that I made. Chris gave me the approval, but we, the team that I had built up and was leading at the time was the data solution architect. So we were focused on just data, either Postgres, Redis, or Kafka. And mm-hmm. some of the customers we worked with had uh, very large and complex databases. And so mm. rather than going back and forth and back and forth in a ticket, we would say, I thought it would be easier to bring them into Slack and and discuss issues as needed there, and that turned out to be a great decision. Looking back on that, because we we had a customer in Slack for over a year, as far as I know, they're still there, um, mm-hmm. and it was it was a great relationship because they would ping us if they ever had a question, but it it would go quiet for days or weeks at a time if we had a new database. Or a new feature that we thought they might be interested in, we could coordinate with them, and uh, it it was a really good example of what was possible as far as supporting customers via Slack. And so, when Chris and I left, we decided to to take that idea and and turn it into the platform experts community. Nice, nice. Okay, so the add on is called Platform Experts, and people can find it on the Heroku add on library, right? Correct. Correct. And that's our show. Now, we will have links in the show notes to the Platform Experts product that they were just describing. Now, before we go, I did ask after Chris and Phil's favorite non-technical hobby, and it turns out they really both like the outdoors. Mine's easy. It's skiing. Nice. Nice. Hands down. Colorado makes sense. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I would say say skiing or hiking, depending on the season. So that's that's (laughs) kind of easy to answer. As somebody who has to survive those seasons of the Midwest, I completely understand. 
I want to thank Chris and Phil for the great information and conversation. And as always, I want to thank you for listening. Now, if you want to learn more about this show, head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can hear old episodes, see the show notes, and have links to your favorite podcast service. Thanks again, everybody. And I'll talk to you next week.